My name is Mike Gabin, and welcome to my KSP campaign. Just here on the moon, time warping, waiting for the Kegel 4 and her crew to get underneath the orbit of the Korion. Oh, there goes the Korion 1 right there, heading towards the north. Like I said, we're just waiting until we're underneath its orbit because we're going to be rendezvousing with it. I think that ought to do it. So we want to put ourselves into that same polar orbit. So we're going to be going towards the north and a little bit west. I always like to think about this a little bit and obviously avoiding that arch there that's going to be in the direction we're going. And we're off. So pitch over. Okay, and we're going a little west of north, so because remember the moon does rotate towards the east, so we want to sort of cancel out some of that rotation, though I don't see see where my prograde vector is. Oh wait, whoa, our apoapsis got up to 11 kilometers, so I had to cut the throttle. Oh, I'm in target mode. There we go. <laughs> Actually, I came out all right. All right, so there we go. So we're going to be circularizing, and then we're in a lower orbit, so we'll be catching up to the Korine. You know the drill for all of this kind of stuff. So why don't I talk about what's coming up in this episode? This episode, actually, the main thing is going to be getting up the propulsion module for my Drez Explorer, the Kermes 1. Uh, that's going to be quite the launch. We're going to get that vessel all together, do some final construction in space and well we're gonna be sort of getting them on their way not quite out of Kerbin's sphere of influence but uh, we're gonna be doing the first burn that will get them hopefully on a path towards Dredd so all of that should be coming up later on in this episode so I kinda wanna go through this moon stuff pretty quickly I do wanna talk a little bit about a mod that I have installed. Uh, I, I installed a mod called Persistent no Rotation. This is one that I was eyeing, been eyeing actually for quite some time. It makes it so that when you time warp, the uh, rotation doesn't stop. It keeps going. And I've always liked that idea, but then I, 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 you've heard me complain in previous episodes about how when the vessel's not an active vessel and it's rotating, even though it has S it's SAS capable, it really kind of annoys me. So I always use time warp to kind of work around that and so that's why I always kind of put off persistent rotation but you can actually use it to help mitigate that in addition it does some other things that are really really cool I'll show you here so I've oriented it so that the solar panels are pointing towards the Sun and what I'm going to do is set the rotation to be relative to the moon so we'll select the moon here we'll do some time warping yeah, I don't want to, I could also set it towards a target, but I don't want to do that. So close that. And we'll do some time warping here. I'll still do some final fiddling with the solar panels. Okay, here we go. And notice that its orientation stays with that of the moon, which actually is not what I want if I want it to stay oriented to the sun. So let's set its rotation relative to the sun. We'll set it up to be oriented again north-south with the solar panels pointing towards the sun. I'll actually use the amount of exposure to see what it is that they're getting good exposure. And now we'll time warp again. And look at that. It stays oriented. It maintains its orientation relative to the sun even as the Kerbin system rotates around the sun. That is really cool. I really like that. And there's a lot of other things you can do to help con not only make the resist uh, rotation consistent, so a little bit more realistic, so that if you use time warp or if you leave that vessel and come back to it, it's still rotating the way you left it. But it also um, gives you these additional tools to do the kinds of really precisely orient the vessel the way you want and do some other things too and I'll get to those later. Right now though obviously we're coming in to Asteroid Yoy and the Korion 1 and also docked with Asteroid Yoy is the Arm B, my asteroid chaser which I really when I got time have to send up some fuel up here so that I can refuel the Arm B, have it go chase down 
another asteroid for me. But we're just going to come in here, and uh, there's nowhere for this guy to dock, and I want to leave it docked with the asteroid. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring it to a relative stop. We're going to fly over Bob over to the Karayan 1. He doesn't have to do too much. He just has to undock the thing and then kind of back it away while our pilot Stala will stay with the Karayan 4. And uh, cause the only one aboard the Karayan 1 is our tourist Merlion who we've left for three days all by yourself on the Karayan 1 while these guys messed around uh, on the surface of the moon. And she was good. She listened to instructions. She didn't play with anything. But oh my gosh, is she getting bored. Uh, she's been uh, spending way too much time watching the same videos over and over again. In fact, she has been here. This is now our 21st day in orbit about the moon. Uh, the tourist contract, all I had to do was get into an orbit. So <laughs> she's like, look, man, I, I, I really I appreciate getting my money's worth and all, but I really, really would like to get home right now. So that's what we're going to do. So we'll uh, dock the Kegel 4 here, and then we'll transfer everybody aboard, including the science, onto the Karayan 1. Anyway, we went and we set up our maneuver, but thanks to our polar orbit, our burn out of here isn't going to be for another couple of days. So we're going to have to revisit these folks probably in the next episode. But before we get onto Kerbin's surface and launch the propulsion module for my Dres Explorer, uh, one quick look at another cool thing you can do with persistent rotation. This is Kerbin Station, which we haven't seen for a little while, but Bartner and McNan and Carol have been working very, very hard while we've been off doing other things. And as you can see here, I'm time warping, but what I've done is I've used persistent rotation to keep that antenna and solar array always pointed away from Kerbin. So you can get really cool shots like this one here. I think that's really cool. It might be docking a little challenging. We'll see how that goes because now like some of my docking ports are actually rotating uh, with Kerbin now. But you know, no more delay. Let's get to the launch of this fuel module. At 677 tons, this is easily the heaviest thing I've lifted so far. And it is being lifted by eight of those Bohr liquid fuel boosters, which is the most powerful engine that I have. Take a look here at the side, maybe, a little bit. Oh, we're going to be losing the first set of boosters here in a little bit. So we'll come back to this view. There we go. Now this thing also has 236 parts uh, and that, when I first designed it, it was actually over the part count. So I had to uh, start taking parts off of it to get it under the part count. At the time I hadn't had the VAB upgraded yet, so there are no parachutes on any of these boosters. They're just going to crash into the ocean. In fact, it was this vehicle that really motivated me to upgrade the VAB finally, so I'm not running into those part counts anymore. As well, my last two tech nodes, you may have noticed a couple of episodes ago, have been um, both heavy rocket part tech nodes, unlocking 3.75 meter fuel tanks and 3.75 meter engines so that I can more easily get large payloads like this into space. I suppose the other distinctive thing about this is that um, the I used modular girders to push the liquid fuel boosters further out. That's for two reasons. One was simply so I could get eight of them around the vehicle. Um, I needed to create a larger circle, a <laughs> greater radius in order to be able to fit eight around. And the other thing is that this thing, this is the propulsion module for my Dres Explorer, remember, and it has um, fuel tanks that will be dropped, dropped fuel tanks that you can see there around the perimeter. Um, and I had, you can't put radial decouplers onto something else with radial decouplers, that doesn't work out well. So I had to ex make, you know, put the radial decouplers on the main body, but then use the modular girders to extend so that they would clear those fuel tanks when they decoupled. And everything in the end worked out really well, though it did take 
quite a lot of finagling to get this thing to work. Anyway, as you can see, we've now had main engine cut off, and the rendezvous with the rest of the Kermes is nothing that you haven't seen before. The Kermes is once again behind me in its orbit, so I did the same trick you saw me use last episode to raise my apoapsis up to around 150 kilometers, then get around and raise my periapsis to 100 kilometers, which is the same altitude as the Kermes. This allowed me to slow myself down, allow the Kermes to catch up and perform uh, a rendezvous drift burn to get there a lot more quickly than I otherwise would have. And speed is a bit of an the essence here. The the actual burn for the dredge transfer isn't for another 12 days, but because of the mass of this thing and the fact that it's using the nuclear engines, even though it's going to be using three of those solid core nuclear engines with something this massive that's not going to provide a lot of thrust, um, I'm going to need those 12 days in order to get my injection burn going, and I'll talk about that a little bit later in this episode. But anyway, it was still a little over two hours, and we were making our final approach to the rest of the Kermes. Now, this vessel has no RCS. It's the Kermes that's going to have to dock with it. Also, once we ditch the boosters and its pro core, it will also have no control. So, uh... I'm going to get myself in close. We're going to kill off uh, our relative velocity. There, it's 0.2 meters per second. We're still 200 meters away, so that's good enough. So we'll make sure these reaction wheels are on, and we'll ditch these boosters. They are autonomous. They have a probe core and a short range. Ooh, they are coming pretty close. Okay, I think we're okay. <laughs> they have a short range antenna on them too, a short range omnidirectional antenna. So we will deorbit those guys uh, later. Don't want them junking it up, but we have other things to worry about. So let's orient ourselves over towards the Kermes to make, to facilitate docking. Coming around slowly, this is a heavy vessel. And then there's a probe core up at the front that I want to ditch, uh, mostly because the Kermes already has some control. Oh, we can deploy that last radiator now. And I really do want to get my rotation under control because I will have no control once this thing is gone. So there's the probe core. It's got a docking port here. And then that will free up that docking port, which is what we need to dock to. And we've got to get rid of this thing. There we go. I got a couple. You'll see them there. There they are, those uh, uh, unidirectional stick anywhere RCS ports. There we go. I'll just push it out of the way. We'll deorbit that later too. Now we just need to get ourselves over to the Kermes. There we are now. Uh, gee, I, I want to fuel up the Dream Chaser. We're not going to be taking the Dream Chaser with us. We're going to have to come up and get somebody to come up and get it. But I do want to fill it up as much as I can. You know, kind of in hindsight now, maybe I should have done this beforehand. But then once that was done, it was time to ditch it. So we'll give ourselves a little bit of rotation here. So that it'll move away from us. Oh, okay, let's get on to... The Kermes, there we go. Okay, so the Dream Chaser is on its way out of here. We'll control from this docking port and we'll do the docking and we'll speed this up too so this doesn't take so long. Yeah, I wanted to fuel up the Dream Chaser because there is a ton of monoprop on this thing thanks to the RCS tug there that is on the left end of the habitation module from our view right here. And that is going to also be detached and deorbited. The final vessel here will have no RCS. Uh, things will dock with it, not the other way around. So we'll move our way in here. And again, for such a cobbled together configuration of various modules, this thing flies along pretty well. You might be noticing as well the KAS struts now that are attached between the command module and the habitation module. The endpoints I had put in there in the VAB, and there are some matching endpoints on the other side, as well as some endpoints that are on the fuel module that need to line up. The struts are going to look right. So I am paying attention to rotation. Oh, 
batteries. This did take a little while because I would kept the fuel module fairly far away so I didn't have to worry. There's so much debris floating around here. I wanted to make sure I didn't end up having to worry about the debris, but eventually we did get it in there and docked. Oh yeah, that's looking pretty good. Looking like a spaceship to me. All right, let's start getting rid of some of this debris. So this is one of those boosters. And I should be able to just point it retrograde. There we go. Oh, it's because, of, yeah, I had it on target. Okay, now and now it's where now those little buttons are working. And we will just burn retrograde. And that's all there is to it. And then we'll deorbit the rest of the debris. And then the FIA will get out there. She will get rid of these RCS blocks that are now that were on the habitation module that are no longer necessary they were there just for balance and then she'll link up these strut endpoints to make sure that the propulsion module is nice and secure remember docking ports really aren't that secure connection at least these 1.25 meter docking ports later on when you get the big 2.5 meter docking ports it's a lot better but for now you definitely want to firm these up with some struts we'll attach the rcs blocks that we don't want to take with us we'll attach those to the little tug and then it's time to deorbit the tug all right so we'll just get in here and decouple that node and there we go it is free so we'll just back it out of here put it on the retrograde vector and deorbit this thing and while I'm doing that you might be noticing that kind of that maneuver node that is attached to this thing this is that's the maneuver node I'd set up for my dress injection burn that is going down with this so I had to reset up the burn again but that's okay because I, I just noted what the numbers were and was able to reset it up again in fact I ended up resetting it better and this also gives me a chance to show you some of the little widgets that are built into the window transfer uh, planner mod like this show ejection angle that's pretty cool now uh, uh, you can see that my nodes not in the right place it shouldn't be right on that 162 degrees to prograde line because the burns still about 11 and a half days away so I figure I should be about 10 degrees ahead of that so I'll just kind of move it to about there I should mention at this time, actually, that uh, I got my angle to prograde of my orbit. Uh, it's probably about a dozen degrees off or so. I talked about that a few episodes ago. Uh, I also have my inclination off by about, uh, it's actually off by two degrees exactly. Um, so I'll try and do a little bit better job setting up the orbit next time. I do have a couple more vehicles on their way to Dresden, not to mention uh, an EVE window coming up in just a couple of dozen days. So. Uh, I'll have another chance of doing this. Hopefully I'll do it better. But so that ended up necessitating a little bit of, well, actually more than a little bit, some normal that had to end up being added to this particular burn. Um, and I ended up playing around with, is it better to do the normal here where it's combined with prograde and the Pythagorean theorem kind of helps you a bit, or is it better to do it way out in interplanetary space and, you know, play around in this particular case, it was better to actually combine the two burns together. But I ended up with, I was pretty happy with it, this 2,078 meter per second burn that will get me to Drez in 322 days, which... The window planner was actually predicting a 2,147 meter per second burn that gets me in 430 days. So, ha, take that math. Actually, I suspect I'll be paying for this upon uh, my insertion because my my angle coming into Drez's orbit is actually pretty steep. So, <laughs> I shouldn't get too cocky about this. The issue is, is that according to Kerbal Engineer, this is going to be a 32 minute burn. Yes, thanks to the powerful one tenth of a G that those uh, nuclear engines can put out for me, even though I have three of them, I can only pull about a tenth of a G with this thing fully fueled. So, I'm going to split the burn into two. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up another burn. Um, I'm taking note of the ratio between the amount of normal and the amount of prograde so that this first burn will be in the same proportion. 
I hope that sort of makes some sense. So I'll have the same proportion of normal to prograde. Um, but I want it to be about half. Actually, it has to be less than half because I want to make sure I don't eject myself from Kerbin's sphere of influence. Yeah, if uh, once you're out of Kerbin's SOI, there's no coming back. So what I'll do is I'll set up a second node here. This will actually be the first node because it's ahead of the first one. And uh, I want it to be right on top of the other node. So we'll just sort of move it forward here. And I got some idea of what I want as far as the amount of uh, the apoapsis to end up with to get me a period that I want. I want the period to be about 11 and a half days so that by the time I come back to that, because that's about how far it is to the actual injection burn to Drez, so by the time I come back to that, uh, I'll be ready to do the second half of this burn. And what I ended up with is this burn that's 943 meters per second, still keeps me within Kerbin's SOI. The burn is still uh, 15 minutes and 48 seconds. So if I take that and split that in two, that means I should be starting to burn at seven minutes and 54 seconds. So here we are, we're coming into it. There's three, two, one, let's do it. Oh, this feels so wrong. <laughs> if you look at the nav ball, or even if you take a look at Kerbin, you can see I'm, I'm almost pointed straight down. Uh, but that's kind of the way I think you have to do it. I hope I'm doing it right. If I put it just on prograde, um, I would end up pushing up my periapsis way too high. So I put it on the maneuver node and just ride this around. Now, biggest concern is while I'm burning like this, I am bringing down my periapsis. And uh, the biggest concern is bringing that periapsis down into Kerbin's atmosphere. Then you're in a little bit of, little bit of trouble. And that's the whole reason, actually, why I put this in a 100-kilometer orbit rather than my usual 80-kilometer orbit that I like to eject from. It was just so that I had some room to bring that periapsis down. Anyway, as you can likely guess, this, this, this took a little while. <laughs> Even with um, using a little bit of physics warp, I didn't go past two on the physics warp because I didn't want to, uh, to uh, I don't know, mess with the physics too much. I guess that's it. I, I get nervous at higher physics warps. And by the way, if you don't know how to get the physics warp when you're not in the atmosphere, you hold the Alt key and then press period like you normally do to advance warp or common to bring it back down. Anyway, I'm not going to show you this whole burn. That would be ridiculous, even in fast motion. So why don't we cut ourselves closer to periapsis where you can see things are not turning out to be too scary. Um, here we are. We're just passing periapsis and my altitude's about 79 kilometers, not that close to the atmosphere at all. So that worked out very, very well. As you can see, there are eight tanks radially attached here. All of these tanks, by the way, are just holding liquid fuel. I didn't want to deal with any kind of cryostatic stuff. So it's, it's just liquid fuel being used as a propellant in these nuclear engines. And right now we're draining fuel from four tanks equally, all at the same time, and not draining it from anywhere else. And of course, when those four tanks are empty, those tanks will be dropped. And you might be wondering, why didn't I drop like drain from just two and drop those two and then I can drop and lose mass more quickly well because those two would have drained before I had achieved an escape velocity out of Kerbin's sphere of influence and if I dropped two at that time they would have remained in orbit around Kerbin and I hate debris in Kerbin's SOI I'm perfectly fine with flinging debris all over the rest of the uh, solar system, but I, I don't like it in orbit around Kerbin. So when I drop four of them, by the time I drain all four of those, we should be on our way out of Kerbin's SOI. Then I can drop four of them, and then those things will end up orbiting the sun somewhere, and I won't have to think about them anymore after that. Why don't we cut a little bit ahead in our trajectory towards the end here. What I'm really looking at, I'm not really looking at the the uh, maneuver nodes so much in the burn on the nav ball. I'm more looking at my orbital period and I want to cut the engines where my orbital period gets to around 11 and a half days because that's how long uh, it's going to be until I get back to do the second half of the burn and then that will time it all right. Uh, 
looking at it now, I kind of wish... I don't know, I could, the orbital period you can see isn't really all that high. I, I add on um, most of the orbital period towards the end of it. Again, that has to do with the Ober's effect. I could have actually taken this burn and split it into two more burns. It's a little late to be thinking about that now. I'm wondering if that would have been more efficient, because all of this time I spent burning in the wrong direction does impact the efficiency. I think I've burned about... 200 meters per second more of delta B than what the burn really asked for, but well, that's what it is, right? That's uh, if you, you know, when you're dealing with such low thrusts, and I think this thing is perfectly ser serviceable with the low thrust, but that's sort of the price you pay because your burns aren't quite as efficient as they otherwise could be, but now I don't have to lug along as many engines as I might otherwise be. Anyway, we're getting close now to the 11 and a half days on the period. All right. A couple more puffs. That'll do it. Okay, so we'll get rid of the maneuver node down here, and there is the other maneuver node, which of course is now completely wrong so <laughs> I have to go in there and adjust that so let's go and do that first and see what we got left to do now uh, okay the node is not in the right place so we need to put it right on our periapsis take maximum advantage of the oberth effect and with just a little bit more tweaking I ended up with this burn 1360 meters per second that will get me to Drez in fairly short order, you might be noticing, by the way, that these this burn, if you take a look at a Delta V map, is actually more than what you would see on a Delta V map because I am getting there in a timely manner as opposed to in an efficient manner. Anyway, I got one last thing I wanted to show you. Um, I went back to the vehicle assembly building and I wanted to work out how far is that hitchhiker can from the central axis. So what I ended up doing is I used these one by one meter structural panels as kind of a ruler, kind of put them together and figured out that the, the deck, I would figure the deck of the hitchhiker can is probably about 7.5 meters from the central axis of our spaceship. And then I used this formula to figure out how much rotation do I need to generate one-third of a G because that's the whole reason I designed this thing this way is so that I can sort of fake uh, having a gravitational field in there. So the formula is this, this acceleration is equal to the radius times omega squared and I'm sorry I don't have an omega symbol I have a W instead. So I put in and I want my um, acceleration to be a third of a g. So that's 9.8 divided by 3. If I put in the 7.5 meters for the r and solve for the omega, I end up with 0 0.660 and this is in radians per second. So you have to do a little bit of converting. You have to multiply by 60 and divide by 2 pi to get that to be 6.3 rpm. And then I'm going to use the persistent rotation mod and simply just enter that in. So 6.3 and activate, and here we go. Obviously it takes a bit to get up to speed, but oh my, look at that. And I did make sure, by the way, that the center of mass of this vehicle, even though it's asymmetric, the center of mass is along that central axis, so it will rotate correctly. Wonderful. And in a little over 11 days, these folks will be back towards periapsis ready to make their burn and become the fastest Kerbals ever. But that's obviously going to have to be for a future episode. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.